Welcome back. Topic four gets the award for the longest topic title for our forum. Title is Coercive Gradualism at Mahan's Strategic Choke Points, colon, Understanding Adversary Approaches for Positional Advantage. Moderating the panel is Dr. Aaron Friedberg from Princeton University, and providing their perspectives are a distinguished panel including Dr. Duncan DePledge from Lowborough University, Dr. Stephanie Pizard from the Rand Corporation, Dr. Evan Ellis from the U.S. Army War College, and Lieutenant Colonel Katie Crumbe from the U.S. Special Operations Command Central. And panelists, I hope I got close to pronouncing those names correctly. Dr. Friedberg is a professor of politics and international affairs at Princeton University, where he has taught since 1987 and co-director of the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs Center for International Security Studies. Dr. Friedberg, we're very uh, anxious to hear your panel's comments. Thank you. General Howard, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the final session of today's meeting. Uh, I'd say I didn't choose the title, uh, but I rather like it because I think it gets at something important. Uh, since the United States has been, for the better part of the last uh, 70 years, a preponderant global power, preponderant maritime power, I think American strategists have gotten used to the idea uh, that we might, if we needed to do so, use choke points to uh, inhibit the movement of potential rivals. But of course, choke points work both ways. Uh, and as, uh, as we know from looking at the map and reading the hand, uh, the United States, too, and other countries uh, confront choke points that could be used against them uh, and to inhibit their ability to project power into critical reasons. So to help us uh, think this through, we have four excellent panelists. Uh, I'm just going to take them in order, ask each to talk for seven, eight minutes, uh, sum up your, your views, then I may have some questions, and then we'll throw things open to the audience. Uh, I'm just going to do it in the order that people's names are listed on the program. So we'll begin with Dr. DePletch. Thank you, Aaron, for that introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here, uh, an honor even. Uh, and I'm going to structure my thoughts around three observations uh, about how the contest for the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap has really evolved since the end of the Cold War. But first, I want to make some general points about this gap. The Greenland-Iceland-UK gap's importance dates back to the First World War, but I'm going to limit my remarks really to the, to the Cold War period. And even then, please forgive me for, for racing through this. But I think it's important that, that we have some sense of shared understanding of, of the area that we're talking about. So during the early Cold War, it became clear that Soviet submarines had to pass through this, this so-called Greenland-Iceland-UK gap in order to move between its, uh, its Arctic bases up in the up in the northwest of Russia uh, and the North Atlantic. And it had to come through this gap in order to be able to bring its submarines within range of continental North America. The US NATO response was to concentrate anti-submarine warfare assets and equipment in and around the gap to prevent the Soviets from slipping through undetected. As the Cold War goes on, though, Soviets, the Soviets develop submarines with longer missiles, reducing the requirement to actually use this gap. Meanwhile, NATO increases its reliance on the transatlantic reinforcements. This is linked to the shift towards a, a more flexible uh, defense posture towards Europe. And so concern shifts away from monitoring for, for Soviet submarines, or, although it's, the Soviet submarines are coming through to, to, strike, a, uh, to strike a continental North America, uh, towards more of a concern that the Soviet forces could break out through the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap to disrupt the flow of transatlantic reinforcements from North America to Europe. So NATO had to essentially defend the line at the gap, stop things coming through. In the 1980s though, the, 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 uh, the, the focus on the gap shifts again, because now the, 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 the Soviets are, are by this point holding up in their so-called bastions, uh, where they can keep their submarines and their strategic nuclear weapons relatively safe. So the US and NATO shift towards this posture of, of forward maritime defense 
the idea being to actually push through the Greenland ice and the UK gap and engage the Soviet Navy as far north as possible in these bastions. We then head into a period of post-Cold War neglect where Russia is no longer an existential threat, its naval forces are in decline. The US and NATO have other priorities, first in the Balkans, then after 9-11, primarily in hot and dusty places. However, I think it's fair to say that in the last decade, there has now been this renewed attention to the gap due to concerns about Russia's resurgence as a major military power. In 2018, we saw the US reestablish the second fleet. NATO has also stood up Joint Forces Command Norfolk. Both of these, uh, both of these, the, but all of this being done with a view to protecting North Atlantic and High North, with the gap very much at the heart of the area of operations. And as part of this, we've also seen significant reinvestment in the areas surrounding the gap, in Greenland, in Iceland, and Scotland as part of the United Kingdom. We could also add Norway to that list. So moving on, I think it's vital that we recognize that the gap has constantly evolved during this time and will continue to do so. And in relation to that, I'd like to draw attention to three important developments, which I think should shape how we think about the gap today. The first is that the maritime space around the gap is becoming more congested. We tend to think of choke points in terms of natural geographic features, but to fully understand a choke point, we also need to think about what's moving through it and how much it's moving through it. What we're seeing then is increasing economic activity, and this is projected to increase further in the future. Things like fisheries, aquaculture, resource development, tourism. So all of this is set to increase further uh, along with the development of new resources and potentially also shipping lanes. But this activity is also involving an ever-widening array of actors, state and non-state, Arctic and non-Arctic. Some of these actors may be overtly hostile to the US and NATO, or at the very least ambivalent about the interests of US and NATO allies in this gap. The second observation is that the character of conflict in the gap could be changing. Old concerns are still there. For example, the idea that, that Russian forces could potentially interdict transatlantic reinforcements but other concerns are beginning to emerge as well. Undersea fiber optic cables. These sorts of telecommunication cables have been around for decades, but they are increasingly now part of critical national infrastructure. They present an acute vulnerability and they need to be protected. Many of these are running through the North Atlantic, but in the future, we could see them going across transpolar routes, making use of this gap. The expansion of renewable energy, offshore wind farms and so on, could potentially be, uh, be another vulnerability. It's also important to think about the future of fish stocks, which are moving north of the gap. And so fishing fleets and so on might be going. So, so it could become a food security issue to actually look after these assets. So really what I'm trying to say here is that there's a need to reevaluate what needs protecting in and around the gap, as well as how we're going to protect it. The third point is that the geopolitics around the gap is far from settled. Just look at Greenland, at Scotland, at the Faroe Islands, not countries that we think about very often, but all of them have the potential to become independent sovereign states in the not so distant future. If that happens, it's by no means certain that they will be members of NATO, that they will be members of the European Union. It's not certain what kind of relationships they might develop with Russia, with China. We know that China has already been seeking commercial influence in these countries, and we also know that Russia has made efforts to try to discredit NATO in these places. Even in Iceland and Norway, there are divisions in domestic politics over how much military activity is desirable in and around the gap. And in Iceland's case, whether NATO membership is even desirable. What all this means is that for the US and NATO, it may be that in the not too distant future, it's going to have to think about renegotiating its basing strategy in relation to the gap. And if the countries of the gap go their own way, there may be very limited capacity for the US and NATO to prevent foreign intrusions and incursions. So I'm going to leave my remarks there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that gets us off to an excellent start. Now, we have another perspective on uh, positional advantage in the Arctic from uh, Dr. Depovich. Uh, Dr. I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Pizzard. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you, Duncan, for getting us started on the, the large topic that, that is the Arctic. Um, so I will talk today about some other strategic choke points in the Arctic. And these are the, the different routes that one can take to navigate the Arctic. So that's the, the Northern Sea Route, the Northwest Passage, and the future Central Arctic Ocean Route. So I will talk about um, 
what are Russia's and China's positions regarding these routes, how much control they have of these routes or wish to have of these routes, and also what challenges this presents for the US. Um, and this panel is on coercive gradualism, and gradualism is really the name of the game, the Arctic, uh, in the sense of a very gradual, but also irreversible physical change that has major geopolitical implications. Um, sea ice melting results in, a, in an opening, if you like, of the Arctic with some uh, routes that were mostly impracticable before or only seasonally uh, becoming uh, more accessible uh, and, and, and more attractive for, uh, for, for shipping, but also any type of navigation, including, including military. Um, so I start with the Northern Sea Route, which runs along Russia's Northern shore um, between the, the Kara Sea and the Bering Strait. And it is becoming increasingly navigable, even though it's not yet a major commercial artery. There were only 27 vessels transiting the, the, the Northern Sea Route in 2018, uh, and 37 in 2019. And these are mostly Russian vessels going from Russia to Russia, basically. Um, but the route has potential. Uh, it's seen as a potential way to bypass the longest southern route uh, to uh, cut the number of days on each trip and also to avoid uh, the Strait of Malacca and Suez. Um, and, and China, along several other Asian nations, are, is very interested in these routes. And Chinese ships actually represent the, the second flag after Russian ships using this route. The Northern Sea Route also has high strategic importance for Russia. Um, basically, it's their, it's their northern border. Uh, the coast is also resource rich, mostly gas. Uh, it connects Russia's east and west. It's a, for, for Russia, it's a major commercial artery. And it also has Murmansk and the Northern Fleet and two thirds of Russia's nuclear deterrent at the European end of the route. And ICE used to create a, a natural protection uh, for this route and for Russia's, Russia's coast, but this, this natural protection is, uh, is slowly eroding. So it's not entirely surprising that Russia has been trying very hard to control this route. And uh, ships that transit through the route have to request uh, authorization to transit. Um, and in many cases, the Northern Sea Route Administration that provides these permissions also requires ships to use um, Russian ice breaking and ice piloting um, services that, that come, uh, that come uh, with, a, with a hefty fee. And Russia justified this policy with uh, Article 234 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea that gives, that gives coastal states some extra control of uh, the uh, so-called ice-covered areas near the coast on their EEZs, and that's in order to um, prevent accidents or environmental damage. So Russia is basically arguing that because there's still a lot of ice on the Northern Sea Route, it has the right to uh, control who gets there. Um, but the US sees that as a viol violation of, uh, of freedom of navigation principles and has threatened to conduct freedom of navigation operations in the Northern Sea Route. Um, there are still questions, however, as to how doable this might be um, based on US capabilities to carry out um, this type of operation uh, in this type of environment. And also how escalatory this might be considering how sensitive Russia is when it comes to um, the security of its, uh, of its Northern coast. Uh, but with sea ice diminishing, Russia's justification, legal justification, is becoming less and less tenable. And uh, there could be tension in the future as, as more, uh, more states um, wish to make a more intensive use of this route. Uh, and that could involve China, especially states that have their own ice breaking capabilities, again, as is becoming the case of China. Um, and interestingly, on the question of freedom of navigation, China would actually probably side with the US. Uh, in its 2018 Arctic policy, it makes clear that it sees the Arctic as a global issue and not one that should uh, be only dealt with by uh, Arctic states. Um, and it also plans for a polar silk road that would be part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and, and obstacles to circulation along this polar silk road would certainly not be in, uh, seen by China in its, in its interest. So why China cooperates with Russia on a number of projects like the 
um, Yamal Peninsula LNG project, for instance, there are still some tension there on the issue of access to, no to the Northern Sea Route. On the other side, on the Canadian side, you've got the Northwest Passage, which, which crosses through the Canadian Arctic archipelago from uh, the Beaufort Sea to basically the, the, the western coast of Greenland. Uh, it's not seen as a, as a viable commercial artery anytime soon because of people's navigation and also uh, a lack of infrastructure. Um, but in 2016, China published a fairly extensive navigation guide for the Northwest Passage, raising questions as to whether it's, it's um, thinking that it might be uh, using more of this route in the future. And navigability increases there as well. Um, again, in 2016, there was the first cruise ship um, that, that used this, uh, this route carrying 1,700 people. And here raising question as to what might have happened if the ship had found itself in trouble, since there's not much infrastructure and uh, not that much search and rescue, but thankfully um, everything, everything went, went fine. Canada does describe the, the passage as internal waterways um, and requires permission to transit through the passage, uh, while the US again sees that as international waters, um, but both countries agree to disagree obviously um, because they have uh, um, common interest in the Arctic elsewhere and extensive cooperation through, through NORAD. So you could ask yourself the question, are the Northern Sea Route and the Northwest Passage really choke points? Um, and they are in the sense that there are, there's currently, there are currently no alternatives to taking these routes in this part of the world. And that coastal states, in this case, Russia and Canada, have the ability to block or, or to prohibit a ship from taking these routes. But at the same time, they're not really choke points in the sense that they are not yet in large use. Um, so any such blockade would really have minimal impact on, on, on shipping or global shipping uh, more broadly, and it would likely hurt the economic and political interest of Russia and Canada. Um, however, the use of these routes is uh, will necessarily increase over time as they become more navigable. Um, so that could give more leverage to these two countries, and that could also put more pressure on the US to decide exactly how far it wants to push um, this, um, the, the freedom of navigation principle in these, in these two areas. Um, that is until the alternative of the Central Arctic Ocean Route opens up. Um, which uh, it's also called the transpolar route. And this, the idea of this route is that instead of going above Canada or Russia, you would cross directly from Asia to Europe above the North Pole. And um, this, this route is seen as potentially opening near 2050 or even sooner, depending on the climate models. So this will um, bring a, an interesting sort of twist um, in the ability to, to navigate the Arctic um, by basically being able to bypass where uh, in, in areas that are not coastal, uh, where no coastal states uh, can exert any, any control. That could make uh, Russia and Canada less relevant, and that could also make uh, the Arctic an attractive way um, to bypass current choke points such as Suez and, and Malacca. So I stop here and I look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ellis. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to, to Jay Sal for the opportunity to uh, share my thoughts. I have uh, a few uh, slides, if we could put them up at this point. Okay, I'm uh, talking about uh, the Panama and the Caribbean Basin uh, with respect to strategic choke points. Of course, uh, the dynamics uh, also involve uh, Russia and China, as well as uh, some other actors. I'm going to also focus a little bit more broadly on the uh, struggle for uh, commercial advantage uh, especially within the context of uh, what the PRC is, is seeking as, as it uh, projects the activities of its companies in terms of access to, to markets and products, but also acknowledging that uh, other actors such as Russia and, and Iran have, have different, uh, oftentimes uh, more um, immediate uh, strategic uh, objectives in, in the region. So just a few comments about the area itself. Uh, first of all, obviously, um, uh, this area is the U.S. Southeast approach. And so in many ways, uh, the impacts to the United States not only involve our, um, our, our uh, security of our homeland, um, but also the uh, connection that we have to the rest of the region in terms of the geographic proximity, in terms of, of flows of, of commerce through the region, as well as uh, flows of, of people, both uh, tourists and migrants and, and others. Um, 
in general, the region uh, economically can be characterized as a region of flows, uh, not only uh, Obviously, as with the other regions, um, the uh, the commerce that comes through the Panama Canal and really throughout the Caribbean, there are a number of, of different uh, uh, important uh, hub ports, uh, which are responsible for the aggregation and, and disaggregation of uh, shipping that serves really the entirety of, of the U.S. Uh, um, uh, Atlantic coast, as well as the Atlantic coast of, of, of South America, among uh, other, other things. But it's also a region of flows in terms of, of the flows of um, uh, of money uh, with a number of different uh, fiscal uh Paradises uh, in the region, uh, well known, uh, the British Virgin Islands, the, the Cayman Island, etc., as well as illicit flows. Uh, of course, when we think of the sense of the region as, as, as a choke point, uh, it's useful to think of the Panama Canal and whether or not that could be closed or not in conjunction with um, the, uh, the southern tip of uh, South America, understanding that if Panama were to be closed, then the transit uh, going through the Straits of Magellan and um, the, um, the area near Puerto Montt and in Ushuaia. In, in the South uh, then become more important. And the position of uh, China uh, and others uh, in conjunction with uh, with Argentina and Chile there becomes more important. But returning to uh, this area, it's also important to recognize that this is actually a much more international space than we commonly think. Uh, so obviously, uh, not only the U.S. has a historic legacy, but the European Union, especially the Kingdom of the Netherlands, uh, through actually a presence of a part of its national territory, Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao, uh, Montserrat, uh, formerly uh, formerly Suriname. Of course, uh, the U.K. through the Commonwealth uh, has the um, ha has a vested interest in the region, as does Canada. Uh, of course, uh, India actually has an important diaspora community in the Caribbean and maintains uh, a significant uh, presence there. And of course, uh, we see in recent years how Russia, uh, Iran, and, and China uh, are engaging uh, in that that region. Uh, a few comments just about some of the stresses that are currently putting the dynamics of the region into play. Um, as elsewhere, you've had a lot of stresses from COVID-19, not only in terms of health, but in terms of uh, really long-term changes uh, to the economies of, of the region due to the hits on, on tourism, which introduces uh, socioeconomic stresses and, and strategic instability, as well as a changing patterns of organized crime in terms of, of narco transits going through the region and, and other things in conjunction with increasingly desperate people. Um, the collapse of Venezuela has had an impact through the region uh, through refugees who not only flow uh, through uh, Colombia um, and down into Brazil, but, but also uh, who uh, go uh, to the east to Guyana, who come through Trinidad and Tobago, who go through uh, some of the island states, uh, again, uh, Arube, Bonaire, um, uh, Curaçao, etc. Uh, one of the new factors, of course, in the region is the uh, new petroleum discoveries uh, in Guyana and Suriname, which are bringing uh, new wealth and, and new actors to to that often neglected uh, part of the, um, the the region, the Guyanese Shield. Uh, of course, the ever question of what the role of, of Cuba is as part of the greater economy and strategic pictures in the Caribbean. And then, of course, uh, the actors of greatest importance um, for this particular analysis. Um, it's important with respect to the PRC, not only its role in logistics, but also to recognize that five of the nine countries in the in the um, hemisphere that recognize Taiwan, uh, something that the PRC wants to, to reverse, are located in the Caribbean, um, specifically uh, Haiti, um, as well as uh, St. Lucia, St. Kitts, um, uh, St. Saint, Saint Vincent's, and, and of course, uh, Belize, uh, if you count that as, as a Caribbean state. In addition, of course, as we'll talk about in a minute, the PRC has substantial uh, commercial presence, as well as actually a lot of military and police interactions, which give it an increasingly large amount of, of soft power with the relatively small and malleable governments of, of the region. Uh, I would argue that Russia tends to focus uh, less on commercial engagement, although there is some. So, for example, uh, in Venezuela with, uh, with, with Rosneft and Rosneft trading. Um, but more than anything, you tend to see uh, Russia, uh, because of its limited economic Economic footprint, uh, being more interested in what I would call strategic provocation with actors such as Venezuela, essentially trying to destabilize the um, the United States in its own backyard um, as it tries to offset uh, U.S. attention to what Russia would like to regard as is its near abroad. Again, um, relatively limited concentration of Russian activities in in the region, uh, primarily to anti-U.S. states, uh, Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and now, of course, the uh, election of Xiomara Castro and her Libre movement in Honduras raises the question of, of whether that um, Russia will build new uh, relations in Honduras. And of course, Iran, um, similarly, uh, a relatively limited presence um, 
um, focused on really strategic provocation for reasons similar to, to Russia, um, mostly engagement uh, with respect to Venezuela, um, helping the oil sector and, and providing some uh, UAVs and in arms, um, some use through Venezuela of, of uh, Iran maintaining presences uh, with, uh, with Hezbollah, especially sending its uh, elite uh, uh, religious forces, the Quds forces uh, through through Venezuela and operating through some of the mosques in the region. Um, so finally, I just wanted to focus on, on a few areas where uh, the PRC has an increasingly uh, significant footprint. Obviously, again, um, PRC recognizes that just like its own uh, Southeast maritime approach, uh, it is strategically important for it to be in the strategic approach for, for the United States in the context of global competition. Um, PRC companies actually have a relatively significant presence uh, in some of those key ports, uh, in including um, in, uh, in, in Freeport, the Bahamas, including, of course, in Panama and both the Cologne and Balboa on the Atlantic and Pacific sides, uh, on Veracruz on the, um, the, the Atlantic side of, of Mexico, uh, CMA ports uh, in Kingston, Jamaica, and the prospect of, of new PRC-based ports operations in Manzanillo on the north side of the Dominican Republic, as well as uh, a new uh, a petroleum and agricultural port that the PRC may have a, a role in in Burbis, Jamaica. Um, in terms of business activities and infrastructure, you see a major presence in, in Jamaica with the, the MDIP and, and, and GDIP uh, infrastructure programs, and the, as well as the, the North-South Highway presence in the bauxite sector, the sugar sector, um, a, almost a dominant presence of the PRC in Barbados, um, uh, both at the Hilton and some, some downtown properties, as well as, of course, uh, recently um, uh, believed to be a, a part of uh, Barbados' decision to pull out of the British uh, Commonwealth. Um, again, the Bahamas, uh, both the Bahamar complex, uh, $4.2 billion, the, the largest uh, commercial property in the, the, the region, as well as the Freeport uh, port complex that I mentioned before. Uh, Guyana, especially given some of the, the uh, people's uh, Progressive Party uh, ties, um, uh, PRC presence becoming more important uh, as, as oil comes online. Uh, also, an oil presence in Trinidad and Tobago, especially uh, ownership of the Atlantic uh, LNG uh, facility, about 10% interest in that, as well as some interest in developing uh, a, a section of the country in the south known, known as La Brea. Of course, uh, in El Salvador, the prospect of, of a new PRC port in La Union and a broader uh, concept. Um, if Honduras changes its relationship, of course, we're talking on the Pacific side, but in, in the broader context, the prospect of, of um, a combined Salvador-Honduras um, uh, development by the PRC of, of the Gulf of Fonseca there and linking to the Atlantic side via dry canals. Um, Costa Rica, um, although uh, has been relatively uh, stable with respect to um, relations with, with the PRC since the 2007 recognition, uh, it actually is um, potentially more vulnerable given that it is in a fiscally very delicate position with IMF loans and repayment requirements right now and is facing a, a very wide open February 2022 election. In a technology, uh, relatively large Huawei presence, not only devices and 4G, but also participation in, in important new 5G projects, including in the Dominican Republic. Um, a lot of fiber optic work uh, basically across the Guyanese Shield, uh, also connecting uh, Cuba to, to Venezuela, a number of different uh, smart cities initiatives, uh, some um, other architectures, uh, such as the, the so, so to speak, Fatherland Identity Card project, um, and some uh, uh, essentially uh, electronic infrastructure activities by uh, CEIEC there, as well as a support to the Cuban telecommunications uh, firm Ectesa in its own uh, telecommunication, as well as a, a presence by the ride-sharing company Didi Chuksung uh, in the Dominican Republic and, and elsewhere, which um, creates a potential for it uh, for, for Chinese companies to, to capture significant data. Again, as I mentioned before, uh, diplomatic changes, uh, the, the two big potential ones on the table right now are Honduras and possibly Haiti, which is undergoing a political instability, uh, creating the opportunity for significant kind of leaps ahead for the PRC presence through MRUs there. And as I mentioned before, um, there actually is more security engagement by China in the region that's commonly recognized. Um, specifically, uh, it was um, eight years in the Minister Peacekeeping Force in Haiti, um, all three of its visits to the region by its hospital ship Peace Arc have involved substantial multiple port stops in the Caribbean. Uh, it's made other port calls, including in Cuba as, as late as 2016. Uh, it has um, conducted a, a broad series of, of uh, military institutional institution visits and leader visits. It's brought most of the leadership of, of the Caribbean uh, 
countries as well as Panama um, to their professional military education institutions, including their short courses in their National uh, Defense University in, in Champaign. Um, it's provided substantial gifts to Latin American militaries and police forces in need, including uh, squad cars and motorcycles uh, to entities like the Guyana Police Force, um, the Trinidad and Tobago uh, Police Force, and the Dominican Republic Police Force, as well as a, a lot of military construction equipment and, and a small number of aircraft to the Guyana Defense Force, the Jamaica Defense Force. And, and others. Um, and also to mention that um, although not directly connected to the Chinese state, um, Chinese communities have long had an important presence in, in, in the region, especially in Suriname and Guyana, but also elsewhere um, with some linkages to uh, human trafficking, money laundering, and, and, and gambling, um, creating some local resentment, uh, but at the same time also uh, um, involving uh, those Chinese communities in the broader uh, panorama of, of organized crime activities in, in the region. So uh, thank you very much. I look forward to uh, questions and, and answers. Thank you very much, Dr. Ellis. Uh, and for our final presentation, Lieutenant Colonel Crumby. Hi, sir. Thanks so much. And a uh, great opportunity here to learn from my fellow panelists about some geographic regions I definitely don't get to think about when I'm talking about the Middle East every day. So thanks again. Um, as the other panel members have alluded to, strategic choke points reside at the heart of international security and commerce and are absolutely critical to the three key priorities that are listed in the international security strategy that was published earlier this year by um, the National Security Advisor. So access and transit through these waterways is required first so that we can maintain the U.S. rules-based international order by allowing access to the global commons. Secondly, access to these choke points allows us to protect the security of the American people by facilitating a rapid shift of US military assets, carriers, ships from the Mediterranean to the Persian Gulf, Indian Ocean, or the other way. And third, transit through these waterways allows us to expand our economic prosperity and opportunity by enabling efficient flow of global commerce. So we definitely recognize it from a national level and not just in the Middle East. Um, before getting further into the choke point discussion, just a reminder of how you know, wild and crazy CENTCOM continues to be. Uh, home to 20 countries, 600 million people, and three of the world's great religions. It's the most energy-rich area in the world and truly where East meets West. So right now in the Middle East, as everyone is aware, um, we're at the convergence of most of the threats listed in our national defense strategy and that we seek to counter on a daily basis. The first being the Iranian malign activity that we all deal with. The second is China's continued economic development and predatory behavior around the world. Third, Russia's military expansion all over the Middle East. And of course, the, the continued threat posed by violence extremist organizations in the United States, Europe, and, and abroad. There are three major maritime lines of communication in the Middle East that not only facilitate civilian and military maritime traffic, but by their nature become choke points, of course. They're subject to disruption or closure by accident or by sabotage, subversion, or outright military action. Our primary adversary in the region, Iran, borders the Straits of Hormuz and actively exercises its Navy in this waterway to both display capability, capacity, and demonstrate the ability to hold, its hold the waterway hostage by mining it or sending small tech aircraft through it. On top of this, Iran actively supports the Houthis, who reside in Yemen right along the Battle of Mendeb, and routinely supports its ally, Bashar al-Assad, in Syria in securing freedom of movement off the coast in the Eastern Med. On top of all this, as we've heard for the last 35 minutes or so, our national interests have moved and reoriented toward the Pacific. So American hegemony of these waterways should not be a guarantee like it was in the past. A little bit about each of the choke points that we can go through kind of in order. First, the Babel Mendeb, sitting at the bottom of the Red Sea. There's an Arab legend that it's actually called or translated to the Gate of Tears for the risks it used to pose to shippers in the past. It separates Asia from Africa by the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden and runs between Yemen and Djibouti, and considered one of the world's most unstable and dangerous waterways. The alternative, however, is absolutely cost prohibitive, prohibitive, as we all know. If we had to go around the Horn of Africa, in the case of, say, oil experts from Saudi Arabia to the US, it would mean an increase of 4,300 kilometers of transit time, an exponential increase in time and money in the global oil markets. And most of us just aren't willing to pay that up front. To reinforce the importance of the BAM, look where China put its first military base globally. They put it in Djibouti, right on the western flank of the Battle of Mendeb. Next, we'll go over to the Straits of Hormuz. Sitting between two friends and a foe, Iran, UAE, and Oman. 
The Iranian regime continues to extend their power through militias and proxies, and they threaten to shut down the straits as a response to sanctions, almost on a monthly basis, posing a serious threat to global oil and the natural gas market. Many of Iran's naval exercises center on displaying the capability to do just this, to shut down the straits. Last year, Iran signed a strategic partnership with China, allowing them in time to exert more influence into the Arabian or Persian Gulf, depending on what side you're on, warring many of the Gulf watchers as yet another source of money is being poured into Iran, allowing them to expand their malign reach around the globe. Last is the Suez, probably the most famous choke point in the world, and at least the one most talked about. It connects the Med to the Red, the Mediterranean, to the Red Sea, and it's Europe and Eastern United States' connection to Asia. Competition for control over the Eastern Mediterranean down through the Suez Canal has been the source of many conflicts in history, and its primacy has definitely not waned, as we found out earlier this year. In March of 2021, ever, everyone remembers the, all the memes that came out, the big shift, the Ever Given, um, completely blocking for six days the Suez Canal, sending you know, shippers all around the world into an absolute tizzy. 15% um, of the world's global traffic maritime-wise, transits through the Suez. It's the shortest shipping route between the East Coast and Asia, and the complete blockage of this canal for six days delayed an estimated $9.6 billion of goods a day, four times the tonnage that goes through the Panama Canal. China, Russia, they also care about the Suez hugely. 60% of their goods, of Chinese goods, I should say, bound for Europe transit through the Suez. And although they've oriented their national strategy kind of on a multi-vectored approach using the Belt and Road Initiative over land for redundancy, it would take 100 train loads to carry the same as one container ship like the Ever Given. Russia, too, is looking at alternatives to the Suez and use this recent blockage to actually promote their northern sea route that our other panelists talked about earlier today. So Russian and Chinese redundancies provide them with leverage should they wish to put pressure on us or any of the other global powers on these checkpoints for either choke points for economic or military reasons in the future. Um, so why does soft care about this? Um, we talk about this a lot at work, um, just when we're um, learning who we should help when it comes to partners and allies, who we should support, um, and how they can help us protect these strategic choke points. So within the three choke points and the central command area of responsibility, just the threat of hostile activities alone can extract a cost upon and disrupt global maritime traffic. The actions of a regular warfare need only present the threat or risk of loss of money to achieve an effect. They don't actually have to do it, just like terrorism. The credible yet deniable threat of holding a choke point hostage, such as the blocking of the Suez earlier this year, the presentation of fact FIACs in the Battle of Mendev or the Straits of Hormuz, or things like GPS jamming, spoofing to run a ship off course into an adversary or into territorial waters, either by nation states or proxies, are all the regular warfare methods below the threshold of armed conflict, so in the gray zone, as we say, that can increase the cost, risk, and drive up global prices. Our special operations forces, we believe, you know, we need to operate in this area to help mitigate the risk, increase the global freedom of navigation and confidence that we all need economically, and to ensure the normal movement of global maritime traffic throughout. Um, so I think that's all I have right now. All right, thank you very much, excellent. Uh, so we have by the clock about 17 minutes for questions and we've started to have some coming in. Uh, Dr. Ellis, why don't we start with you? A uh, question was raised as to whether you see an overarching uh, Chinese regional strategy in the area that you discussed. Good question. Uh, Multi-layer answer. Uh, first of all, I actually see a broad consistency in general Chinese strategy across regions. Uh, in, in other words, uh, uh, China's uh, approach uh, looking for access reliably to, to markets, uh, access reliably to sources of supply, uh, the use of multidimensional infrastructure to, to leverage that. Um, you see uh, um, that play out in many ways in Africa as well as Latin America as, as well as uh, Central Asia and in, in the Middle East, et cetera, with differences that reflect uh, the historical legacies, which are different, the distances, which are different, um, the composition of governments and the Chinese relation to them. Um, having said that, however, uh, 
in terms of Latin America specifically, uh, there is a tendency, you, you, you do tend to see um, a greater amount of, of Chinese deference uh, in Latin America. Uh, you tend to see uh, the leadership uh, through SOEs um, and, and through it, its various different agents, which gives you a certain amount of, of, of uh, uh, deniability. Um, again, in a, a search for you know, ownership, uh, the military uh, tends to be, I, I would say, relatively low key. Uh, and, and I would regard it currently as a um, supporting element of the strategy rather than the primary strategy. In other words, that China, even in Panama, leads with its economic endeavors and uses that to generate uh, influence. And, and through that influence, it opens up the door to mill-mill cooperation, um, which I believe over the long term, um, it, uh, it it allows it not only to, to sell its goods, but also to turn, but also to um, you know prepare for the eventuality uh, if it ever had the opportunity and need to operate in that uh, AOR is, is a part of a broader broader strategy. But it is very much, I think, uh, economically led. Um, it complements and it is, um, but it's it's not actively coordinated with Russia and Iran. So I, I would here notice that um, Russia and Iran, because of their lesser connectivity and interdependence in, in the region, are, are more able to, to do aggressive things like, again, um, you know, Quds Force uh, or selling of um, of, uh, um, of of drones and, and things like that, or, or deploying air defense assets in Venezuela, China benefits from Russian and Iranian chaos without being directly tainted by it. Um, and Russia benefits from Chinese money without having to actually pay it. So, so I think uh, it, it's it's multidimensional, but there is a strategy. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Pizard. Could you say a little bit about the utility of these northern routes that you described? Uh, what kinds of ships? Uh, how many? How big? Uh, and roughly when, depending on how rapidly uh, the climate changes. Definitely. So you do have a number of, of tankers, especially with the development of um, this LNG uh, facility in the Yamal Peninsula. Um, you, um, you, you still have a limited number of ships overall. Uh, I said, I think the number I had were 27 uh, ships transiting the route in um, 2018 and 37 in 2019. Um, but interestingly, China is pretty close to Russia in the in the number of ships um, that that use the route. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that it's not really a linear process, so it's not like ice melts and it's easier to use the route. You actually have this sort of uh, transitional period where you get ice floats instead of um, sort of, um, you know, bigger um, sheets of ice that you can locate more easily. Um, so in the meantime, you know, you can have the ice melts, but it makes navigation actually harder um, because it's, it's more hazardous. So you've got higher insurance costs. Um, you're also more uncertain as to how long exactly the trip is going to to take. Um, so it's not it's not exactly, you know, the um, a, a, a very attractive navigation route now, um, but it's definitely become going to become more in the future because you know you you just uh, go from these um, sort of ice floats to broader opening for longer uh, longer times of the year. You don't you you don't have that sort of you know seasonal constraints that you have at the moment. Um, and to give you a time frame is kind of difficult because again it's it's not like it's not navigable or it is. It's kind of every shade in between, um, and also just like the opening of the Central Arctic Ocean route it depends a lot on uh, climate models that can change sort of predictions by, you know, 10, 10 or 15 years. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. DePledge, could you say a little bit more about the scenarios that, that you envision uh, for the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap? Are, are you imagining a situation in which the United States and perhaps its NATO allies might once again uh, operate in those waters to try to prevent Russian submarines from coming out into the Atlantic? What, what kinds of scenarios are you thinking about? So I think there's, uh, the, there's a combination of things here. I mean, the, uh, the question of submarines is, is already very much a live issue. Um, so, so, so what, what is, is different now, I guess, is the fact that rather than, than, than sheer numbers of, of Russian submarines, the concern is that actually there's a, there's a smaller number of but, but very highly capable submarines. So the, 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 the Russians are, are much better now at producing quieter submarines, for example, that can evade some of the sort of traditional detection missions. 
So, so you know, and they're carrying more missiles, they're larger. So, so if just one one Russian submarine gets through, it could do a lot of damage in in, in the North Atlantic. So, so that's already been on the agenda for a while, and, and we see these fairly regular reports that um, you know Russian military activity, Russian submarine activity is is sort of approaching levels not seen since the Cold War. I mean, it, it really is that 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 level of concern. Related to that, there there is also growing concern. I don't think. There's any evidence of it yet, but certainly on a sort of a 10 to 20 year time frame, we might also be thinking about Chinese submarine activity. Uh, the Chinese, as far as we're aware, appear to have some interest in potentially developing an under ice capability. And if that were the case, then, then you would be looking for Chinese as well as Russian submarines potentially coming into, in, into the North Atlantic. In addition to those military scenarios, though, I think, I think the other concern is, is, is about in places like, like Greenland and Iceland, um, sort of five, ten years ago, there was a lot of uh, attention on these places from China, looking to invest in these places, much as we've heard um, about in the Caribbean as well. And 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 initially, this was kind of welcomed, but then it, there's been a lot more kickback against that, you know, in, in, in more recent years. And I think that's another thing just to be watching is uh, how, I guess, these sort of marginalized, underdeveloped communities in very wealthy countries might be tempted to, to, uh, to uh, might be tempted by, by foreign investment. I don't know whether it's uh, appropriate to, to discuss in this context, but can you say anything about uh, what would be required for the U.S. And, and its allies to get back to a level of capability similar to the one they had during the Cold War? Has has all of this been shut down and locked up uh, and simply needs to be reopened uh, or is it a, a bigger task i think it's i think it's a bigger task i think i think we're already seeing quite a few some positive steps uh, so you know the the, the americans re returned to keflavik for example and there's increasing cooperation again between america uk and norway on p8 uh, and anti submarine warfare exercises the anti-submarine warfare exercises actually restarted in around about 2011-2012, NATO maritime exercises that is. So, so there is a lot of activity going on in that space. We've also seen various uh, NATO exercises like Trident Juncture, which brought a significant number of surface ships into, into the high north for the first time since Cold War, including on the American side. But everything I hear from, from, from Americans talking about this is that there's a realization of just how much skill and experience has actually been lost since the Cold War. And there was, there, there was almost a sense of surprise back in 2018 during Trident Juncture, just how hostile these waters are actually to operate in, just, just in terms of dealing with the, the environmental conditions before you even try to actually fight uh, or, 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 or engage in, in, in competition in these areas. So at the moment, it, it's still relearning the environment, um, but need to get to the point of, of being able to conduct serious operations. Thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Crombie, of the three uh, choke points that you mentioned, is any one of them uh, easier to close than the other, is harder to reopen, and is one of them more significant in terms of its economic and or military impact if it were to be closed? How would you, how would you rank them? Yeah, I mean, depending on if we wanted to do global or military, I would be most worried about the Straits of Hormuz just because of the um, adjacent to Iran, right? I mean, they have the ability to shut that down um, in tomorrow, the next minute, if they wanted to. Um, and as far as if we went to war with Iran, obviously the Straits of Hormuz are absolutely required to get planes, trains, automobiles into fight the war, right? So as you move from kind of phase zero to phase three of active conflict, if that shut down, that would obviously be a detriment to us. And of course, if you plan that as a, as a strategic planner, you know, you always have a second, third course of action um, should the Straits of Hormuz close. But I think that would have the biggest impact militarily. Um, I think the Suez Canal would obviously have the most impact um, on a global economic level. Uh, and one thing that I didn't have the chance to talk about as well when um, I gave my opening comments was the importance of the Abraham Accords to all of this as well. So, you know, Israel's um, detente with the UAE and Bahrain and a number of other Arab nations, and uh, could be more coming, that lends itself to, um, you know, a lot of opportunities for agreement to reopen something like the Suez Canal. So that, that is something that hasn't been talked about as much either. And just the opportunity going forward for things like joint military exercises, especially naval exercises with Israel and the Eastern Mediterranean um, and getting, you know, 
a number of the Arab nations up there to exercise off the coast of Israel, Syria, um, you know, hand in hand, Israelis and an Arab nation. That is quite a show of force to Russia, China, um, Libya, you know, pick, pick an issue that's along the Eastern Mediterranean. But the Abraham Accords has been a significant change to our posture and how we look at the region this year as well. Okay, thank you. Dr. Ellis, um, from what you describe, it seems that China in particular has taken a fairly low key approach to its activities in, uh, in Central America and around the Caribbean, perhaps in part because of an awareness of how sensitive that area is to the United States. But if you imagine a world in which competition has intensified and become more open, uh, a range of things might become uh, possible that don't seem to be now. And in particular, the possibility of China trying to acquire some kind of dual use facility or base uh, in the region. Is there any particular place in the area that you look at that seems to you to be the most likely target if that were to happen? Great question. Um, well, and first of all, um, you know, right now is is, is the PRC uh, expands its uh, you know out of area capabilities, global capabilities. Um, you know, it, it tends to uh, develop bases as it has the ability to defend them. Um, and you see that kind of moving out. I mean, J Djibouti obviously, as was alluded to before, um, you know, with the with the Suez Canal, et cetera. Now looking at, uh, I believe, we just made public on the Atlantic uh, coast of Africa, et cetera. I think uh, China is not yet in the position where it is would be able to defend or, or use a military base. In, in the region um, in 10 to 20 years. However, we're given where it's shipping as well as its economic presence and footprint are going, I, I think that would be realistic. Um, obviously, the I think if, if it does, uh, probably the, the near term is, is a question of Ushuaia kind of edging into uh, Antarctica. And actually, frankly, um, if you close down Panama, the ability to transit the Straits of Magellan makes that more capable. And, and also um, from a space signature uh, perspective, if, if you're going to come over the pole, for example, with a hyperglide missile, um, the ability to track that, um, you know, from from you know from something in, in that area also becomes valuable. Um, but uh, but beyond Argentina, I think as you move forward, um, you. you see the usual suspects, obviously Panama, um, you know, candidates like the presence it's building in El Salvador, obviously eventually, um, you know, desirable to have something in the Caribbean. But what most concerns me in the near term um, is that without any explicit base agreements, um, China is using its logistics knowledge, its, its mill to mill um, in order, you know, if it found itself tomorrow or in five years in, in a conflict over South China Sea, East China Sea, Taiwan Straits, et, et cetera, um, and, um, you know, it went to a more protracted conflict, um, how quickly if it had the opportunity to to base out of someplace even without an agreement um and you know and i would say that you could do that relatively more quickly than we expect in, in ways that would and in every bit of information about logistics, where the railheads are, you know what the characteristics of the, the ports are that come from its commercial operations, um, speed up that that that, that timetable. And so I always emphasize that even if we say that China is not yet ready to put a base in, uh, the U.S. needs to be prepared for Chinese operations that would put uh, CONUS and, and the region at risk um, from that type of quick turnaround operation in a in, in a conflict. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more quick answer. So uh, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Pizard, uh, this is a question that came from the audience. Um, are there strategic opportunities for uh, the NATO allies with the opening of uh, or the possible opening of polar routes? And related, how exactly can Western countries uh, defend shipping uh, through waters that run so close to China's, uh, to Russia's frontiers? Well, there, there are op opportunities and uh, and challenges. Uh, I see in opportunities mostly in the commercial domain, uh, um, and uh, potentially challenges more in the in the military domain. Um, when you have increasing traffic in areas that remain hazardous um, with difficult navigation conditions, you um, I have a higher risk of, of accidents, of uh, environmental damage, but also of miscalculation and potentially escalatory steps between uh, countries that might, you know, might, be, might be nervous um, about this uh, increasing traffic, especially when it's close to their shores like, like Russia. Um, so this, this sort of risk of unintended es escalation or, or miscalculation uh, is really going to have to be uh, monitored closely when, when these routes open uh, more broadly. Uh, in terms of opportunities, um, again, more, more potentially sort of in the 
um, the broader strategic um, commercial uh, domain. Um, also, in um, we, we were talking about um, communities, Arctic communities that uh, would like more development, more infrastructure, and China potentially stepping in. Um, but it doesn't have to be just China stepping in. Um, and when um, President Trump mentioned the possibility of, of buying Greenland, um, Greenland's response were, was, we're not for sale, but we're open for business. And I think that that would be the answer of a lot of these Arctic communities. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank all the panelists. I've learned a lot from listening to you and look forward to seeing what you have to say and write on these issues in future. Um, thank you, all of you. And let me turn it back now to General Howard. Well, thank you, Dr. Friedberg and all the panelists for a brilliant but somewhat sobering presentation. I'm uh, taken today I don't quote Aristotle often because, well, I, some people think I'm as old as Aristotle, but I'm not. But Aristotle said the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And he said it in a very, for a very positive meaning in that the way the parts combine creates something of greater value. I'm wondering if we can use that after today's presentations in a more negative context and that the way the parts combine creates something of greater threat, particularly when we consider the integrated, interactive way that the threats work and the way we've heard about them today. Particularly when you think of uh, Dr. Wilson's compound threats dilemma, compound threats analysis, in my view, we may be facing something of a compound nature that we haven't really come to grips with yet. The good news after my fairly negative statement is that tomorrow we're going to talk about solutions for these uh, various problems we've talked about today. Solutions we're hoping and we're fairly certain will be soft unique, perhaps soft peculiar, they incorporate interagency, ally, partner, and other views to include looking at geoeconomics and finance that can be used for resistance and resilience operations. We look forward to your participation tomorrow. As a reminder, your feedback is important to us. Please take a few minutes before you sign off to provide feedback or the for the individual panels by scanning the session feedback QR code found on the scrolling slides. So, so long for now. Please join us tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern Time for another what we hope will be exciting day of presentations. Thank you.